Hey listeners, it's Jill. Did you enjoy our episode with author Todd C. Elliott as much as we did? Are you itching to get your hand on a copy of his latest ghostly novel, The Lower Line? Well, now you can. Leave us an iTunes review and we'll pick one lucky reviewer to win their very own copy. To learn more about where you can get yours, visit our website at thefire.com. Now, enjoy the show. You're listening to the Screaming Pods Network. So do you have, do you ever think about how how little we may actually know? Like like how stupid people used to be? Like people thought like the world was flat and like Well not stupid, well, some just people, uneducated. Yeah, some people yeah. How uninformed people once were. Like how how modern medicine used to be back in the day yeah of leeches and stuff oh yeah i never would have been able to survive that if that was the norm people thought the earth was the center of the universe like there's a lot we don't know we can't really comprehend all the things we don't know it's sort of unfortunate that you know these i'll say fringe sciences these pseudosciences have sort of been branded as a waste of time or you know not as important as more mainstream disciplines. But I think it's important that we pay attention to those things. Right. I I mean, as long as people have their own testimonials on their experiences, we can't really discredit anything until we prove that, that they either saw something else or experienced something else that was in the norm. Like who's to say aliens don't exist. Who's to say Bigfoot isn't real. And who's to say there's no life after death. Right, it's 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 not very helpful to to try and prove something doesn't exist. You know, you can try to find the explanation behind it. Exactly. To gain any sort of understanding, you have to do research. You have to investigate. And we're so excited today to have two women working in the paranormal investigation field share their story with us and share their techniques of investigating. Oftentimes we think of it as just purely a spiritual connection, which can be so deep and so compelling. But then there's also the side of backing it up with with data and facts and and trying to to show different trends using different methods of research. Yeah, I I think we had a little rant in one of our very first episodes about making like a massively produced television show, you know, like you're sort of pressured to get that evidence and whether it's really there or not. Yeah, you're pressured to get that evidence to make it, you know, a good TV show. But from somebody who has tried their hand at a very short term investigation uh, a couple of days, I wouldn't even call it an investigation is more of, of just trying something fun a lot of the times it isn't as sexy as people like it to think it's it takes a lot of patience it takes a lot of dedication and it takes a lot of time you're examining film you're listening to audio clips and you're trying to convey the feelings that you have when you're in when you're in a certain area or a, a situation and you know other people may not be as sensitive to those experiences as you are so it can be frustrating at times We've hunted down two investigators in this field, um, both ladies. Girl power. (laughs) Um, And we're really excited to share their knowledge and stories with you tonight. First up, we have Katie Webb. Katie has a deep connection to magic and the paranormal. She started reading tarot for spirits, ghosts, and others roughly three years ago. Now she even runs her own class. Katie also uses her gifts to play an essential part of the Haunt Me Paranormal Investigation Group. She's the occultist which means she brings a unique and powerful skill set to the team, pure magic. By harnessing the occult like a sword, Katie aims to cut through the darkness, promising to bring light to those who seek it, both living and beyond. My interest in the paranormal started um, as a child. I mean, I was always, horror movies were always my favorite, ghosts in particular, because they always felt so real and it was always the one thing that 
actually scared me, and I always really like being scared. In 2001, I went to the University of Maine at Farmington, and it was kind of, the people I met, they were kind of really into partying, and I wasn't so much, and so I would kind of go off on my own and just explore um, Farmington around the college, and I ended up meeting up with some people who were kind of doing the same thing, and we stumbled upon an abandoned building. I happened to have a disposable camera on me, so I just started snapping shots. Um, I had a, I just had a feeling it was haunted. Um, you know, abandoned buildings just kind of give you that feeling anyway. <laughs> I just started snapping pictures around it, you know, joking with my friends, like, wouldn't it be crazy if a little girl popped up in one of these pictures or in the mailbox or, you know, trying to creep everybody out. And I ended up taking a picture of my friend in front of sort of, um, a big bramble bush, basically. And inside the bush was a like a broken horse-drawn carriage, basically. When I got the film developed, a, a little girl was standing next to her in the picture. So that was my first evidence I ever caught. And from that point on, I was super interested I would watch some of the ghost shows, but I have to be honest, they, they actually um, never, they never really like meant anything to me. I was more into fantasy and I was more into the idea of um, other realms and other dimensions and other beings, which sort of makes sense as to who I've become. My interest in the occult goes back even further. It all started with the movie Hocus Pocus. <laughs> it was my absolute favorite, favorite movie as a kid. Um, my childhood best friend and I rented it so much that the local video rental place gave it to us. <laughs> Every time it expired, we would just re-rent it. We just loved it. We constantly were pretending we were witches. Um, and then one day I visited Salem and I realized that you can actually be a witch and you can have all of the stuff that they have. You can wear the velvet cloaks and have an athame and, you know, look into a crystal ball and it's not just a Disney movie. It's actually real and magic is real. And I sort of realized that when I was like 10, it's just been a lifestyle for me. And so naturally when, you know, when you're starting to kind of like look into these sorts of things, you learn that there's not just one way to practice magic. There's all sorts of different kinds of ways. And I was a sort of rebellious teenager, so I thought Aleister Crowley was so cool. <laughs> and I thought Led Zeppelin was so cool. And it was all about Lord of the Rings and Aleister Crowley. And I just wanted everything to do with Crowley, even his dark side. I was interested in all realms of magic. And then I learned about these other forms of magic that are more like science and chemistry based, like alchemy. And this other one that I, the name of it is escaping me, but the whole premise of it is magnets. Um, and it's not involved <laughs> with insane clown posse. Um, <laughs> But I, I've just been researching magic ever since. And that's basically it. It's like I wouldn't necessarily say that I'm like um, any type of expert because there's just so much. And I feel like the minute you think you're an expert, you begin to limit yourself and you limit the growth that you can have in magic. And so I'm just constantly learning and I just love it. <laughs> I have a few crazy experiences with magic. One of the earliest things that I did that really blew my own mind was I had this laptop and it was an old like Sony Vio when they were like so cool and hip and it broke. And I was supposed to turn in a paper or something and I like really needed my computer and it really couldn't break. I didn't have my, you know, there was no cloud back then. So I had my paper saved, but it was only saved on my computer. So I had to 
get my computer turned back on. And so I had recently been really focused on the receiving hand and like the giving hand. So, you know, in magic, they say you, there's a receiving hand and a giving hand. And depending on the book you read, the hand sort of changes. But it's pretty natural to think that your giving hand is your dominant hand and your receiving hand is the other hand. So that's sort of how I was interpreting it. And so I, I'm a right-handed person and I put my right hand on my computer and I just focused and I focused and I probably stood there for no more than five minutes. I mean, it felt like a century, but it couldn't have been longer than five minutes. And my freaking computer turned on <laughs> and it turned on long enough for me to get my paper, print it, and then it turned back off, but the next day it turned back on again and was working. So, you know, we can think that I maybe had nothing to do with it, or maybe I did, but I just know that I was like screaming when I, when it turned on <laughs> because I didn't even hit a power button. I mean, I just had my hand on the monitor and it just turned on. In the very beginning of Haunt Me, um, we we're new and um, test, me working with magic and spirits was new and I didn't understand the level to which I needed to protect myself and everybody else. I would say probably the third investigation, and this is a guess because I don't ultimately know when this happened, but my guess is if you've watched season one, The Schoolhouse is an episode where we went to this building and basically nothing happened. It was actually one of the most boring ghost hunts I've ever been on in my life. I feel like I've traced back this moment. So I ended up with a spirit attachment. And I didn't know that I had a spirit attachment until many months went on. And I actually had it for two years. And this attachment according to um, a healer that I go to was attached to my throat and my heart chakras. Um, most people are familiar with the seven ener energy centers of our body, the seven chakras, but we have more than that. Um, it, we don't just have seven, we have something like 20 to 50 or something like that. But the seven energy centers that are the most famous are our most powerful energy centers and they run down the center of our body the healer that I go to is actually a good friend of mine at this point, and she was a good friend of my best friend at the time. I just had never met her, and the very first thing she ever said to me was, do you know that there's something with you? It's not in this room. She, you know, her office is protected, and so she's like, it didn't enter this room with us, but it is depleting your throat and your heart chakras. And as you talk to me, I can hear your throat shaking, and I kind of thought to myself like wow yeah my throat shakes and my voice shakes all the time and that's sort of new for me because I'm quite boisterous and kind of animated and but and I, I wasn't and I actually honestly I mean this is kind of sad but I did develop um, a pretty detrimental alcohol problem because when a spirit is attached to you they don't want you at your full capacity but simultaneously they kind of need you at your full capacity in order to obtain your energy. Somebody else's personality is sort of meshing with your own energy and you're like fusing together and you're becoming something different. It's not like the exorcist, you know, you're not this crazy like green puke spitting thing. You're just a little off. So it sounds like Katie's been armed with this gift. She has this really unique sense of connecting with the spiritual world. It's something I don't have. I'm, I don't know if I'd be envious of this because I, I don't know if she can turn it on and off or, or if she needs to be more open in certain situations. But that'd be a, a tough thing to live with. Yeah, that's a good point. I know there are a lot of theories that different people have different like sensitivities to that sort of thing and maybe that's why it's such like a 
divisive, I guess, issue. Some people say there's no way ghosts could exist. But then you have these very sensitive individuals who just have this insane gift for something that I'll say the majority of the population lacks. So I know that Katie's gift has put her in some super terrifying situations when it comes to her ghost investigation team, Haunt Me. Yeah, Katie told us about this super old building in Rumford, the GRCC, the Greater Rumford Community Center. They built it in 1911, and pretty much people that worked there and the troves of paranormal investigation groups that have been through that place pretty much all say the same thing, that there's no doubt in their mind that it is haunted. Now, I don't, I don't, I couldn't find any historical, like, reasons, like, it's not built on any massive Indian burial grounds that I know of, but I guess it's just haunted. To learn a little bit more about some theories on, you know, why this particular building is haunted, you should definitely check out the episode. Um, It is season three, episode one. But we have an exclusive from Katie and her personal experience in the GRCC. I believe Haunt Me Season 2 is the first time we go to the GRCC. It's in Rumford, like I mentioned, and there is a ghost hunting team that regularly visits this place. I believe they're called Graves. And they are the ones who told us about it. And they told us that they go there all the time and they get all of this evidence from all of these different people. And they've brought in mediums and mediums say that there is a portal there. So we're excited and we go in and we're getting a tour and they're sort of showing us like, this is this ghost hallway and this is where this ghost is and that ghost and all these different things because they're very familiar with the place. And they take us into the basement and Picture walking in to your typical main basement, cement floors, really dark, musty, much colder than the rest of the building. So instantly your senses heighten because it's cold, it's dark, and it's scary. So I'm on full alert in the basement and, you you know, your spidey senses kind of start tingling. You're like, something's here. I feel it. Something's here. I'm not just, I know I'm scared, but I'm not just scared. It's something else. And I look to my left, and there are two doors. One door goes into sort of like a boiler room, and another door goes into sort of a mini catacombs area. And this creature crawls out on all fours, and it looked like it was like some type of a bondage creature. Like it was all black, shiny, leathery, on all fours, crawls out, crawl sideways, maintains eye contact with me this whole time, but I will be really loose in the term eye contact because it has no eyes, and it crawls backwards into the other door. Now, you know, I'm like, all right, Katie, you're scaring yourself. That was crazy. But at the same time, I've seen different things in the past, so I do have a level of trust with myself. So I keep an open mind about it. I realize that maybe I'm processing what I saw through my own personal nightmare filter and fueling my own nightmares by being, by like attributing these kinds of characteristics to this creature. But I, but I stay on alert and not too much happens with that creature um, that night. We kind of get, we, we talk with other spirits and different things. And then we leave. A few months later, we decide to go back to the GRCC because, I mean, from our evidence, it really does seem like there's a portal in the gym. All of the footsteps come out of one specific area and they surround you. Um, So it really does have that sort of feeling. Um, So we're excited to continue to investigate. So we bring a public investigation there not realizing sort of what we're getting them into. And what do I see but a creepy, crawly creature again, this time on the wall. 
crawling across the wall like a spider, but just arms and legs, but almost like like its elbows are sort of in front of its arms, like its bones aren't like our bones, but it sort of has human qualities. And so I don't tell anybody about it because I don't want to scare anybody that's there any more than they are because there's ghosts everywhere and we're getting a ton of evidence and everybody's already really scared. So we go into the gym and um, this, along the gym is a bench and I sit down next to this woman and she starts telling me about some sounds that she was hearing and she starts talking about her and her husband. Like me and my husband have been hearing this sound and that sound and I didn't think too much of it because even though her husband wasn't sitting next to her I didn't realize she was talking about in that moment I sort of thought she was talking about in general like hearing these sounds all night long and so I'm going yeah yeah wow cool and then all of a sudden she screams because she sees her husband walk through the doors on the other side of the gym and she thought the whole time he had been sitting next to her and whatever was sitting next to her she was scared because it scratched her down her neck and her chest. Katie then calls Greg Newkirk and Dana Matthews for help. They're the creators and curators of the Traveling Museum of the Paranormal and Occult. They have more than 20 years of experience with ghost hunting. They drive up from Kentucky and they bring the museum with them. So we set up a bunch of their haunted objects. Um, in the Greater Rumford Community Center, and we decide that we're going to do a little ghost hunting without the objects, and then we're going to do a little ghost hunting with the objects. We break up into groups. Dana and I are together, and then everybody else, Ashley, Carol, Hi, and Greg um, are a group. And so Dana and I investigate upstairs. So we are in the gym where the portal is, we did a little um, we did a little spell. Dana is also a witch, and so we did a little magic and we did a little communication spell. But we also did a little peace because there are children's spirits in the place as well. So, you know, if you're conjuring up something to talk to other spirits that could ramp up the energy, you you might ramp up energy for some of more of the more dangerous spirits if that's a thing in the building. So we wanted to keep the children's spirits safe while we're doing. Um, our altar in the basement they are using um, a tool called the dr60 this is a recorder Um, it's a recorder from either the late 80s or 90s but it's old enough that they weren't super good at making the recorder and it doesn't filter out any of the noise um, around you which makes it perfect for ghost hunting because any new recorder is too good at what it does and it filters out any of background noise which is exactly what you need for ghost hunting. So it's an older it's an older model. They don't make it anymore, but um, Greg Newkirk has one. The real beauty of the DR60 is that when you record, the recorder will only record when something is speaking. So you can have an EVP session um, that lasts like, you know, 20 minutes. You can ask questions, and if nothing is answering you, even if you do 30 seconds in between each question, it will rapid fire through your questions when you go to play it back if nothing responds. So it's a really great way to hear spirits in real time and kind of have progressing questions so that you can actually get answers and figure out a plan with the spirits. Greg, Ty, Carol, and Ashley are all in the basement And they are talking to a woman named Anne, who we had made contact with in one of our previous attempts um, at the GRCC. Anne says that there is a creepy, crawly man in the basement. And when you see the footage, right after they hear that there's a creepy, crawly man in the basement, Ty actually sees it with his eyes, and he sees what I saw. He sees a shiny, black, muscly creature crawling towards them on all fours. And he freaks out. Ty doesn't, like, see spirits. Um, you know, if it's, a, if it's like a full-body apparition, sure, he'll see that. But he doesn't 
typically see spirits. He more just gets like a feeling. So it really freaked him out. And then so they go to ask some progressing questions about this crawling thing and it disappears and it's gone. Well, it's gone because it's actually upstairs with Dana and I. We didn't know it at the time, but I actually, up until this moment, I didn't consider that it could leave the basement, but of course it could. Why not, you know? So Dana and I, actually, we have Billy. The um, Billy is a haunted African idol um, from the Congo who they've done a lot of research and they've um, found out some really cool things about Billy. Um, you should be a member of the museum to find out more. <laughs> um, but Billy um, is just their fun name for him. Um, it's not actually his real name. It was, he earned that name because he was giving people nightmares. And so, and he's an African idol. So like Billy idol, you know, trying to make him less scary. It was, it's cute. Um, so we all call him Billy. Um, and he's um, become a really great source of protection. And so he was actually with Dana and I in the gym. And we're sort of just kind of chatting with spirits. I'm like pulling tarot cards. We're talking to the people in the room. And then all of a sudden, Dana says that something is crawling up the wall. And I knew exactly what she was talking about. I hadn't seen it, but I knew it. I knew exactly what it was. And lo and behold, my eyes lock on it. And this time it's not black and shiny, it's white. It's a different color. So it crawls up the wall and then it starts crawling towards us. So we don't have a DR60, there's only one. These things cost like $1,000, so we only have one of them. We've got a K2. So for you, those of you who don't know what that is, that's um, a very typical ghost hunter tool. It's just like an electrician's way to find different electrical spots in a, in a wall where, where in a building, wherever they go. Um, and it picks up ghost energies. And so um, it has different lights on it. And it goes green, yellow. It's like green, double green, yellow, orange, and red. And so red typically means there's like a, a lot of energy, like a really strong force near you. Um, and then, you know, the levels go down as like the spirit gets either further away or reduces the amount of energy they have. So we've got Billy sitting in front of us and a K2 in front of him. And all of a sudden the K2 starts moving like it's, like it's picking up voice, like, um, like how like voice would pick up visually, like up and down, up and down, like Billy's talking to something. And then all of a sudden it starts shooting up to red, like he's yelling at something. And Dana and I are seeing this white crawling thing, creepy crawl toward us. And it starts picking up speed. And as it picks up speed, Billy starts yelling more and more and more. And he's yelling and he's yelling and he's yelling. And we're like, we're freaking out. We're shaking. We're clutched together. We're like, we're very scared. It's a very scary thing because we can both see it with our eyes and then all of a sudden it's gone and Billy stops yelling we don't know what he did or anything but it was just gone and it was gone for the rest of the night I study elementals and I study um, other beings and Carol studies different types of extraterrestrials and in none of our studies does this creature come up? We don't really find anything online when we research it. Um, it seems, you know, when you want to, when you try to logic it away, it seems made up. It may have been like a happy dog wagging its tail for all I know. But, I mean, Billy didn't seem to think so. And that's the same thing with being scratched. I mean, we don't necessarily know that the scratching is malicious. You know, when a dog gets excited to see you, they jump, and that can feel malicious at times, but it's not. It's excitement. And so it's hard to determine what the intent of these creatures is, but no matter what their intent is, I stay protected because you cannot assume the best, especially when you cannot have an open dialogue with these and you have no idea what they are. 
later on, about a month later, Ty goes to a paranormal convention and he meets up with this woman named Dawn. And she starts telling Ty about these creatures that her daughters both see. And Ty almost poops his pants right there because what is Dawn describing? She's describing the creatures we see in the Greater Rumford Community Center. Her daughters both see them. One of them, one of the daughters describes it as black and shiny with its elbows bent backwards and it has no eyes. And the other daughter describes it as white and no eyes. Like the white, it's, it's the same, it's just not shiny. It's like just white and scary looking. And the daughter that sees the black one gets scratched in her sleep. So first off, if I was her, after I saw that that thing crawl out, I wouldn't have brought a group of people there. (laughs) Even a group of people I disliked. (laughs) I wouldn't have gone back there myself. (laughs) Yeah, that's insane. What do you think that thing was? I don't know the... uh... I, I Some have guy no in a idea. gimp costume, I just like pl- like planted there. <laughs> Who's to say it's if it's an evil spirit? Maybe it's a demon. And then I don't have any experience with demons. I really haven't seen an actual ghost. I've seen shadows, but I don't really have a way to gauge if it would be human or not because I I don't really know what an apparition looks like. And I guess it's all about it's perception how right. how you see it. Um, maybe. Because, like she said, Ty doesn't normally see the spirits. He he can see apparitions of humans, but that makes me think that that this had some type of evil intent. It was kind of manipulating how and who could see it and at what time, and it kind of seemed like it was playing with the group. Yeah, and then there's these children on the other side of the country seeing it? Or something similar. I don't know. Maybe there's like a whole demon population and (laughs) they all generally look the same. So if a prevailing theory I have is all about geographical locations and maybe it just happens that the GRCC falls in one of these locations where maybe there is a portal. You know, if you watch the episode um, or episodes where the Hunt Me team is inside this place they get briefed about how other mediums have been there and they confirm that there's a portal, quote unquote portal, somewhere in the place. And and you know, one one medium, all right, sure. A medium said that, all right. But if you, w- when you bring in the second medium and she's saying the exact same shit as or the he. first medium, they, whoever, whomever. <laughs> We're not here to that, brush up on grammar. <laughs> that That's when I'm... Being like, all right, maybe, I don't know, maybe there's a forum where all the mediums are posting their notes and they're comparing notes so they can all stay in business. Maybe it's a medium conspiracy. I don't think so. (laughs) I don't think there's a (laughs) medium conspiracy. Either way, either way, something could be, there could be a wormhole or something there and maybe it's connecting to this Carol woman's house. No, that's a great theory, because who's to say that maybe there's not some type of unique quality in each one of those locations, and who's to say there aren't other people out there experiencing this as well? Yeah, and who's to say it's not, given that this whole ghost thing is real, how how does it work? Like, is it just this energy being manifested in in our reality or is it like another dimension sort of intersecting ours just at the right place and time where we're able to witness it or capture it or something see ben and this is why we need to study it this is why it's important that people are dedicating their time and their resources to exploring this because we don't have answers we don't know we have we don't have definitive proof but we can't discredit people's experiences because you know, people like Katie are are finding evidence and they're compiling it into some type of digestible format. And other people are having similar experiences as to what we see from the Haunt Me team. We definitely encourage everybody to check out Haunt Me's web series and the paranormal. 
It's filled with wonderful information and a ton of really great evidence if this is something that you're truly interested in. Um, you can visit their website, haunt-me.com. Uh, they have a new season dropping this summer. And if you're into tarot, uh, Katie's Facebook page is Sun Sorceress Tarot. Um, you can find more information about the classes that she offers there and on the Haunt Me website. Uh, we'll also have information on the Traveling Museum of the Paranormal and Occult on our website as well, so you can learn a little bit about that. So while Katie uses an element of spirituality to guide her journey through paranormal investigation, Donna Oliver takes more of a technical approach with her methods. Donna Oliver is the founder of Philly Ghost Hunt, a small paranormal group serving Philadelphia and the surrounding areas. Donna's goal is to capture the most compelling evidence possible and then hand it back to the community of believers and learners or anybody who's curious for discussion and further exploration. Her trademark tools are dowsing rods, digital voice recorders, and spirit boxes. I have had some paranormal experiences throughout my life. I was never a good sleeper. I was kind of like a hyperactive child, to say the least. You know, my parents would put me to bed and hope for the best. Like, hopefully she'll, she'll go to sleep. I was in the morning waking up and telling them about the lady. Essentially, the story that I was telling them was that a lady would come into my room and she would sit on my bed and we'd have a nice little conversation about just general things that I was doing. Um, my new doll, maybe a trip to the park, a birthday party, my friend. She would stay until I went to sleep. She would say goodnight and she would kind of tell me to settle down and, and go to sleep. And I would. My parents were like, what? You know, a lady coming into her room at night? No. So they're asking me to describe her. And I'm saying, well, she's kind of white. Uh, she's sort of flowy, <laughs> and they're saying, what, does she look like anyone we know? Uh, no, I've never seen her before. My parents would look into the room, they never saw her, but they they came to believe that she existed based on what I would say about her. My memory is that I, I do recall uh, seeing sort of a gossamer figure come come in through the doorway and sit on the bed, and I remember talking. That was Donna's first encounter with the paranormal, and it stuck with her all of her life. In the time since, Donna formed a ghost investigation team based in Philadelphia to dig deeper and look for evidence of the afterlife. Ultimately, if you can speak to, to those who have passed on, um, spirits, Essentially, one way or another, they're going to let you know that you can do that. I started Philly Ghost Hunt about a year and a half ago, almost two years ago now. We're a small paranormal group, and we do um, paranormal investigations. Philadelphia is a very historic place. This, this is, Philadelphia was like, you know, for, for listeners who don't realize it, it it's like what Washington, D.C. is except that this was during the colonial times. I mean, this was really where the country started. So the, the history is just so rich here. There are so many things to explore and so many stories and so many legends. And, um, and of course, it's that way, you know, throughout the United States. But Philadelphia really has, has a, a wonderful concentration of it. Donna uses a wide range of techniques to collect evidence from her investigations. Her approach is scientific and logical. It's rooted in classic methods, but she also uses newer technologies to help draw her conclusions. When I look at an investigation, I don't say, oh, here's a picture, look, the place is haunted, or oh, here's an orb, or I see this. It, 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 it's a variety of things. For example, the, the one thing that I do um, always, I use dowsing rods. They, they've been around for centuries. Um, they, you know, come in and out of popularity. When you hold them open will mean yes. If you cross them closed will be no. Straight ahead will be either that you choose not to answer or that you simply don't have an answer. An intelligent being, let's say, 
will move it in those directions based upon my request. So then I know that I, I have communication. So it is essentially a dowsing rod interview, but I will do pretty much the entire time that I'm at a location. The other thing I'll do is have um, a digital voice recorder on me, on my person, probably around my wrist or something. And so that will be running from the time I get to the location until probably 15 minutes after I leave. One of the things that I look to do is when I get um, an answer on the dowsing rod, I hope that I get some EVP that supports it. Either um, additional uh, details or further explanation. I was doing a battlefield and I, he identified himself as a soldier through the um, interview part. And I said, what is your name? He said, my name is John. Can you tell me your wife's name? Cynthia. So, you know, when you, th there's, there's no man around because it's, it's only women. It's Billy Ghost Hunt. And when you get the presence of a male voice on the recorder and it supports exactly what's being said on the dowsing rods and it's, um, timely and meaningful in terms of the conversation, I can tell you that it, it's made believers out of very hard skeptics. We asked Donna to share with us, in her opinion, what are the most haunted places that she's investigated? One of the scariest she's worked was at St. Al's Parish in Upper Darby, Pennsylvania. This, this is a really interesting um, investigation. I, I thought it was just going to be sort of cut and dry because so many other um, paranormal groups went here and like they came out with really minimal evidence. And I'm like, I don't know, maybe, maybe this is just one that's just legend and, it, and there's nothing to it. Couldn't be further from the case. When I got there, I was like, wow, this is great. St. Alice is, uh, it was a parish that is uh, located in eastern Delaware County in Pennsylvania. It's about 15 minutes out of Philadelphia. It's in Upper Darby, Pennsylvania, actually, uh, in what they call the Bywood section. It, the parish was about 100 years old. Um, it originally, um, the, the grounds included uh, a large Roman Catholic church, uh, a parochial school, uh, elementary school, convent and a rectory. It was very strong, uh, very traditional um, Roman Catholics who, who were the original um, parishioners, mostly um, Italian and Irish immigrants in the area. And so the, the parish and the school and the church had um, a, a very big place in the community over the years. It became known um, by all the natives in the area as St. Alice and it was known that St. Alice was really haunted. There have been reports over the years of um, shadowy figures roaming around the ground. Shadowy figures looking out of the uh, top windows of the school. Music playing. Things getting moved. Things disappearing. Doors opening. Phones that were not being used, uh, having a busy signal, being engaged. Toilets flushing on their own. So, you know, it, it kind of was like a haunting, but then you said, okay, there's reports of some poltergeist activity. I really focused on the area between the school and the convent. Um, and it was sort of by this spooky little tree that, you know, was dormant for the winter. And, you know, the, the just really a, a scary little place to be, probably about 25 degrees out. It was freezing. And, you know, I'm, I'm conducting this interview and the um, spirit, the being, said that she was a little girl. That's how she identified herself. And when I asked, are you a child? She said, yes, on the dowsing rods and on the EVP. She said, I am. And so again, you, you know, it's that layering of evidence that's just amazing. The school and the parish were closed by the Archdiocese of Philadelphia 
I think the school was closed in like 2006, maybe the, the church closed in 2013. The fact that it was pretty much uninhabited and not being really um, used for much of anything on a daily basis means that, uh, according to the belief, the, the paranormal activity sometimes increases. I am actually putting together a presentation for St. Alice's Nail, so that should should be hopefully up soon with the EVPs and, and all the details of the, the history involved with the whole area. So yeah, it was, it was a pretty thorough investigation that went well, I would say. <laughs> I just love how results-oriented Donna and her team are. I mean, the fact that they compare findings with different certain types of mediums that they use to you know, gather their evidence, and everything kind of aligns with the timeline um, where they're using all these different methods and techniques. It's just really interesting the level of expertise and knowledge that she brings to her investigations. Uh, I mean, you, you see and you hear of people using this equipment and... Um, and it's just interesting to see how you can use everything together to draw your conclusions. Um, I know that Donna mentioned a few different techniques, um, specifically dowsing rods and EVPs. Yes. For those of you who don't know, dowsing rods are when you see like the people holding, they're usually the two like L-shaped, capital L-shaped sticks or wires or something. And they hold them and there's some sort of unseen force or energy that causes the the wires to cross effectively and this is used for a number of things um i i think in some places they refer to this as like witching a well you they claim you can use the same sort of technique to find um water underground in the case of paranormal investigation it is the spirits or this energy whatever um influencing the rods to uh, cross or go apart or something based on the questions that are being asked. Yeah, and an EVP stands for Electronic Voice Phenomenon. So within ghost hunting and parapsychology, electronic voice phenomena are sounds found on electronic recordings. They're interpreted as spirit voices that have been either unintentionally recorded or intentionally requested and recorded. You know, result of an answer. Um, are you a man or a woman? And then maybe you won't hear it at the time, but maybe you'll have a response from a spirit. If you're recording and you play back that recording, sometimes you can hear a very faint response to a, a voice of somebody who you didn't know was present. Um, Don has actually provided us with an EVP debut from her investigation at the St. Alice Parish. Uh, we're going to play this for you in its entirety, and then we'll break it down and you can draw your own conclusions. Female. Female. Yes, female. Are you an adult? Are you a child? You're, you're a child? Again? Yes, okay. Um, I understand there was a haunting here. Did you have any connection with that years ago, many years ago? Yes, you did. Okay. All right, now we'll isolate the actual EVP itself. You're a child? Again? Yes, okay. It went pretty quick. Let's slow it down. Again. You're, you're a child? Again? Yes, okay. So this is what Donna was referring to in her story when she said she caught a little girl saying, I am. Yeah, what do you think this ghost is saying? Do you think it's a ghost? Do you think there's a logical explanation behind, you know, capturing this audio? So let's step back to EVP just in general for a second. I think we talked about the psychological phenomenon of paradelia. I don't know how to really say it, but we talked about it, I think, back when I shared my story about when we did the ITC, where we, the instrumental transcommunication, where we took the video camera and pointed it at the TV that was projecting what the camera was seeing, creating this like 
loop of feedback uh, and we saw a person. So this could be the same idea, but with audio. You know, there's literal noise instead of visual noise that you're just interpreting meaning from um, because something sounds like a human voice. And there's also, um, I don't know if this is what was going on here, but there's also like physics can help explain away this too. Sometimes I pick up radio transmissions and like my headphones, even though my headphones aren't powered at all, the, you know, frequencies that the tower is sending out can cause, you know, speakers to vibrate and amplify that signal. But in this case, I don't know, kind of sounds like a little kid. Definitely sounds like a little kid. And I think one of the reasons why people respect Donna's research um, so much is because she's comparing it to other experiences that are happening in cadence with the EVP. So I believe in the story, you can refer back to uh, the section where she discusses, you know, capturing this EVP at the same time that her dowsing rods, you know, gave her the, the same response that she captured in an audio file. I think, you know, that timestamp, it, it really helps. It really helps you think on one one side of the line versus the other. Yeah, I mean, dowsing rods are another, I guess, controversial tool. But still, to have the two together agreeing with one another. It's either an amazing coincidence or awesome evidence captured at the St. Alice Parish. Uh, there are more EVPs that you can find on Donna's YouTube channel, Philly Ghost Hunt. Um, Donna's hope is that by sharing her work, believers and perhaps a few skeptics will reach out for greater insight into what lies beyond our physical existence. Like I said, you can check out our EVP recordings on YouTube. Uh, she also has photographs and other research findings available on her website, phillyghosthunt.net. And make sure to give her a follow on Twitter at Philly Ghost Hunt. Once again, big thank you to Katie Webb and Donna Oliver for coming on and sharing their stories. With you us. ladies rock. We love you. Yeah, you're welcome back anytime. Yeah, it's inspiring to see two two female investigators in the community um, with the intent to shed light on the unknown and bring peace to the afterlife. So thank you for all that you do. And if you want to be like Katie, if you want to be like Donna, and you have a story to share, let us know. Yeah, tell us about your ghost hunting experience. Uh, we had Twitter user Voodoo John tell us about a scary experience he had in the woods when he interacted with the spirits of the children, the abandoned town Pierre Cheney of Michigan, uh, which you might recognize from one of our earlier episodes. So thanks for sharing that with us, Voodoo John. Um, speaking of Twitter, follow us at underscore the underscore fire. Stay up to date on all of our fun podcast happenings. And if you enjoyed this episode, tell your friends. Word of mouth is the probably the best way to help a podcast like us. Yeah, make sure to rate and review us on your favorite podcast streaming site. And if you do it on iTunes, you could win yourself an awesome, awesome new book, The Lower Line by Todd C. Elliott. We appreciate you all. Thanks again for listening. We hope that uh, we didn't scare you too badly with these <laughs> terrifying tales of paranormal investigation. <laughs> oh, maybe you do. I don't care. <laughs> As always, my name is Ben. And this is Jill. Thank you for joining us. And we'll see you next time at the fire. The music you heard this episode was made possible by the following artists. Black Ant. The Insider. Spinning Clocks. Lee Rosevere, Kevin Hartnell, Lloyd Evans 09, Seclarence, Ryan Little, Nocturnum, and Anatech. You can check out all of their music on freemusicarchive.org and freesound.org. And if you like this podcast, check out our network, the Screaming Pods Network. Great shows for everyone. Welcome to our new network shows. Psychotronic Coast to Coast, inspired by Michael J. Weldon's Psychotronic Video Magazine, Owen Neal and Skinslip are your resident psycho cinemanauts, diving into the wild, weird, and wonderful world of psychotronic cinema. Join the boys each episode as they reveal their thoughts on a pair of movies most won't watch. And Textual Relations, a podcast about love and literary adaptations, hosted by a couple of book lovers and formal English majors, Christian and Courtney Bates Hardy. Each episode looks in depth at a text, whether it's a book, short story, or a play, and then examines whatever forms or mediums it was. listening to 
the Screaming Pods Network. Adapted into. Again, you can find these shows and so many other amazing shows on ScreamingPods.com.